Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I've learned so much that I think I can use it in our research. So I probably should say something about um, my disciplinary background because it's quite different, I think, from anybody's here. Um, my training was both undergraduate and graduate was in an interdisciplinary department, and many of you are interdisciplinary, but these were different disciplines. It was sociology, um, anthropology, and social psychology, and I'm a I identify as a developmental cultural psychologist. So, um, this is the title, and here is my outline. Um, so I'm gonna start with my theory of social change and human development, and then move to uh, the empirical evidence for the theory on both the cultural level, where I'll be looking at national samples of, of books, um, as a cultural product of the nation using the Google Ngram Viewer. And this is where big data come in. And then I'm going to relate that to the individual level where we get our data by interviewing actual people uh, face to face. So now for the theory. So the basic concept of the theory um, is that sociodemographics drive value, oops, oh. This came out. Sorry, I touched it. Let's see if I, if I can get it back. Hmm. I'm not having too much luck with. It's finicky. Yeah, it's very. I'm sorry. I won't touch it no, again. No I problem. promise. <laughs> Kind of okay, yeah. Let's see if I... Yeah. Okay. So the, the basic concept is that sociodemographics drive values on both the cultural and the individual level. And these... This is really weird. Something, something does, it does not like my computer, this system, but, because um, it was changing slides without my touching it, <laughs> which is kind of scary. Um, these, it's a multi-level theory, and these are the relations, the specific relations I'm going to be dealing with in the research that I want to present. So the idea is that sociodemographics uh, influence values on the cultural level, the left side, and they also uh, influence learning environments, and then learning environments in turn influence values on the individual level. I'm going to start by expanding the sociodemographic level. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like flat, oh my gosh, I guess this is really weird because my presenter tools aren't working now. And that that's not the slide I'm getting. Okay, I got it. It's like, it's like flashing all different slides on my computer and all different texts. Well, except that I'm just going to use the presenter tools where I have my text, so my presenter tools are going, okay, um, I think there's nothing else I can do for the moment. Okay, so um, the concepts of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, of German words, come from a German sociologist of the 1800s, uh, Tunis. Uh, Gemeinschaft is usually translated as community, Gesellschaft as society, and uh, these are ideal types in the, that anchor in the way I look at it, dimensions. So what is a Gemeinschaft? Um, Gemeinschaft, uh, in terms of ecology, is rural, has simple technology, most education is at home, families are large, 
uh, the economy is based on subsistence activities and people are poorer. Gesellschaft, uh, tr usually translated as society, is what we all live in. Uh, the ecology is urban. Um, Oh, it has complex technology, more opportunity for formal education, small families. In terms of um, the economy, economy is based on commerce, money, and the accumulation of goods, and people are wealthier. Now my slides aren't even changing. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, so that was the model under social stability, but here is um, a model under social change conditions, and the, these red arrows are the social change arrows, and they represent the dominant direction of change in our global world, from rural to ur urban, from simple to complex technology, from most education at home to more opportunity for formal education, from large families to small families, and from subsistence uh, activities to commercial activities, from being poorer to being wealthier. But social change, it's not a unidirectional theory, and social change can also happen in the opposite direction. So uh, this has happened, for example, in the United States most recently, um, where we went from wealthier to poorer, the, the, the letters that are in red at the bottom, during the Great Recession. We've done a study of the Great Recession, but today I'm going to be talking about the dominant direction of social change in the world and its effects. Okay. So now for the uh, empirical evidence starting on the cultural level. And first I'm going to talk about a study of 200 years in the US and the UK. And this will use the Google Ngram viewer. OK, so on the level of cultural values, the uh, yellow circles, um, the values on the left are adaptive in a Gemeinschaft or rural environment, giving to others obedience, uh, the importance of authority relations, religion in everyday life, social connection. The qualities on the right, the values on the right, are adaptive in a Gesellschaft environment, personal possessions, child-centeredness, the unique self, individuality. Now for the method. Um, we use the, or I use the Google Ngram Viewer, which does automated content analysis of the Google Books corpus, and we selected the years from 1800, between 1800 and 2000. The main corpus in this study was 1,160,000 books published in the United States, our replication sample was 350,000 books published in Great Britain. And you can relate long-term cultural trends to long-term socio-demographic trends. And in this case, we selected urbanization as our socio-demographic trend. Okay, so some methodological um, details. Um, we'll be looking at word frequencies over time. Uh, we selected words to index values, and values were selected um, because they could test the theoretically based predictions, which I've already um, uh, told you about. Uh, one of the methodological um, items you have to keep in, in mind when choosing words, because obviously word choice is very, very important, they have to be um, high frequency words. Um, otherwise, they won't show up as, as reflecting change on the one hand, and on the other hand, you need high frequency words because you want the, these words to be, um, represent the culture as a whole. If they're very, very low frequency, that would not be fulfilled. Uh, the words need to have a relatively narrow range of meanings because 
Um, you don't want words that are going to be used in such widely different contexts. You want words that will be used in the context you kind of have in mind in, in um, saying that these are value words. Um, so um, one of our methodological um, controls, you might say, was that the graph for every selected word was replicated um, with a synonym from a different part of speech. And that was in order to make sure that the findings related to a value concept, not to a specific word or to a specific part of speech. Um, in this study, um, 28 words in all were tested. I'm going to show you only 10 for time reasons. Okay, now for the data. First, the socio-demographic uh, shifts. And here you can see in the United States, uh, one thing about this study that I think has been of interest is we often think of the United States as not going through culture change, that this is something that happens in countries that are just developing industrialization and technology and so forth. Um, but what this study shows both dem demographically but all, and also in terms of values, we also have gone uh, through changes that are, very, that are very common in the world at large. So here you see um, the percentage of um, population from between 1800 and 2000 that is an urban um, population or a rural population. And you see 200 years of population shift to urban environments. Um, I selected urbanization because it's the one socio-demographic that the U.S. Census has been assessing since 1800. Um, but um, in the next study, the, the study in China will have multiple indices of Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft shift. So urbanization is kind of a stand-in for all of those other things like technology, like a formal education that I showed you when I was talking about my um, theory. Is this U.S. Census data? Yes. Okay. Okay, so here is, um, here is um, the uh, percentage uh, the percentage of words, okay, um, the percentages on the left side are the percentage of the target words, and the blue line in the target word is give, over the total number of words in the corpus for that year. And what you can see is that um, the word give is going down in general, the word get is going up in general, and this is exactly what um, I would predict based on the um, on the urbanization. However, there's a, there's also a short-term deviation from this pattern between 1940, which is World War II, and the 1960s, which is the civil rights movement. During that period, the frequency of get declined as well, perhaps reflecting a decline of self-interest motivation during World War II and the Civil Rights Movement. Um, get starts to rise again in the 70s, perhaps 1970s, perhaps because of the onset of the women's movement. And the 1970s are the point where the final crossover takes place with get becoming more frequent than give from that time until the final year studied in 200. Um, the pattern was replicated with the synonyms benevolence for give and acquisition for get, different parts of speech. And the same patterns um, was, as, was as, we, as I found in a books published in the United States was also found for books published in uh, the UK for all of the um, words. Yeah. It does instant, um, instant content analysis. You put in a word. We could, we could do a demonstration, and I don't know if you're going to do one tomorrow. Yes. Um, no. I don't think. I, I think because time is a little short to lunch, I can't really do a demonstration here. I'm actually, my computer's not even hooked up to the internet. But you put what you do is you go on um, the web page 
You just like, you, to find the webpage, just go Google Ngram Viewer, Google it, it comes up, and then it allows you to input words, and you, you can choose your language, input words, you, um, I could, there's like one English database that puts together the US and the um, UK, but then there are also separate ones. So you can select, a, as, as I did, the US database, put in the words, or you can select the UK database, put in the words. In less than one second, you have your results, um, at, and you have your graphs. So, yeah. And you'll see, we can probably try things out if people want to do it. In fact, you can do it yourself. Uh, don't do it while I'm talking. <laughs> don't multitask. <laughs> what, what books are in the it, It's okay, I'm going to get into that. Um, but I'll just say they, they, um, they've, they've scanned uh, books from major libraries. Uh, for example, the UCLA Library, the University of Michigan Library, the Oxford Library, but I'm going to get into that as a methodological issue after I uh, talk about the Chinese data. I just have a few questions. And so you have no, uh, one thing that people often don't recognize, re uh, realize is you have no um, access to the books themselves, and partly that's for copyright reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of Well, people, you know, this is just starting. There are probably only seven or eight, at most, seven studies right now. So we've been developing tools, and um, those are the tools that I developed. Partly, well, the, the, my controls were all suggested by my reviewers. Um, but, for example, Igor Grossman has a recent study also in Psych Science. He uses a different set of controls. The interesting thing is we're all getting the same result. Um, so uh, I, I would say that um, you know the methodology is still developing. There are now a few different models. So we, we replicated the study for German and it works. So what you can do is there are like synonym uh, dictionaries also online. Like we used um, a rule saying you just take the first so many synonyms and run it also, and then it depends on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, you know I selected my original set of words by by the, the criteria I gave you, but then when I I went into a thesaurus, I didn't do any more selection, and I got replication with every word, which I mean I was really scared. Actually, um, and but it happened. It holds. Pardon? It holds. It holds because the theory is good. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I would say. I have a uh, question about the corpus. Sure. The, so books, no, no periodicals, no newspapers. No periodicals, and of course, um, in the Chinese study, well, a pe you know, one criticism um, has been, well, there's a lag. You know, you're going year to year. It takes a while to write a book and publish a book. Um, so in the next study, using uh, the Chinese database, uh, in response to that criticism, we um, looked at w surrounding years, and it didn't matter. You know, you could take you know taking account of the lag uh, by looking at you know years before and years after, and we still got the same results. But um, I'm going to talk about, about um, strengths and weaknesses, because that does relate to a strength, both a strength and a weakness. Um, I have a postdoc coming uh, at the end of this month from Japan. There's no Google database in Japanese. And um, so he, but he likes this general idea, and so he's planning to use newspapers, <coughs> because there is a Japanese online database of newspapers that's searchable. And so that will have the advantage of, um, of being more accurate in terms of short-term change and not having that lag between uh, the writing and the publication. Okay. My 
my um, screen is still going crazy, so I'm going to stick it away from my computer. So here are um, here are some results um, on the top. Are, are words that relate to individualism, all predict and, and um, items that are adaptive in a gazelle shaft environment, their frequencies all go up. Individual, self, unique, and child. At the bottom are words that represent uh, values that are important and highly valued in a gamine shaft environment, obedience, authority, belong, and pray. That's pray, religion in everyday life, belong, social belongingness, um, authority relations and obeying elders, for example, or authority figures. And you can see as predicted, they all go down in relative um, frequency from 1800 to 2000. So let me conclude. Um, this study, so as predicted by the theory, as urban populations rose in the United States and the United Kingdom, words indexing values adapted to gazelle shaft environments rose in frequency, while words indexing values adapted to gamine shaft environments declined in frequency. And one thing I didn't mention with the last slide, that one also, those graph lines were also um, or those patterns were replicated with synonyms and replicated in the UK with the exact same set of words. Okay, so now I'm going to go from 200 years in the US and the UK to 39 years in China. And here my um, collaborator was Rong Zhang. Uh, she's now an assistant professor at the Chinese Administrative College in uh, Beijing. She was a visiting graduate student from Beijing Normal University when we did this. So on the left in the, in the yellow, yellow um, oval, um, you see two um, values that are, that are traditionally well, that are adaptive in a rural agricultural um, society with less formal education and poorer. And then on the right, privacy, that's community and obedience. And then on the right, privacy and autonomy. You'll recognize those as being aspects of individualism. And um, I think you'll recognize those as being extremely pertinent to adaptation in our urban, commercial, formally educated and wealthier society. So um, now I'm going to give some political context. And I think you could see f even from the US results, it's not just the socio-demographics. Politics are closely related. And that was, is very true in China. And that is very much taken account of in this study. So in contemporary history, the Cultural Revolution, which went from 1966 to 1976, drove Chinese people to an extremely collectivistic society. Um, in the Chinese language, the word or concept of collectivism implies giving, contributing, donating, and even sacrificing to the group or the nation. Oh, I didn't know. I might have gotten rid of the, my problem with the flashing screens. So um, as I think everybody realizes, China has been in a very rapid socio-demographic tran transition. Um, it's had very rapid and radical changes since the Chinese State Party officially launched its economic reforms in 1978. And the Chinese economy has been growing at a very, very fast pace. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you see uh, data, socio-demographic data from the World Bank. Uh, urban population going from about 17% in 1970 to about 52% in 2012. Um, household expenditures is the measure of wealth 
going from about um, $114 to uh, uh, about $1,214 uh, between 1970 and 2012. And tertiary school enrollment, or post-secondary is another term for tertiary school enrollment, uh, this one is really amazing. It's 0.13 of 1%, it's 0.13 of, you know, 13 hundredth of 1% 1 in 1970 to 24.33% um, in 2011. So there's been a huge uh, shift from a very Gemeinschaft uh, country to a much more Gesellschaft country. So our question was, what happens to traditional collectivistic values in such a dramatically changing society? Are individualistic values stepping onto the stage? And then are there any conflicts or confusion in the process of value change because, because the change has happened so rapidly? And then finally, how closely are the values linked to socio-demographic indicators? So we again use the Google Ngram viewer. We selected the period from 1970 to 2008, 1970 being the middle of the Cultural Revolution, 2008 being the end of the corpus. So we're going from the Cultural Revolution into the market economy. Um, we selected it we selected 1970 because it was the middle of the Cultural Revolution, but there was also another reason. They didn't have socioeconomic indicators before that time in China. Uh, there were 277,189 Chinese books in this period. Some words um, were selected uh, that replicated the words used in the first study, and I would say that's a kind of control also, in a way. Um, others were selected from Chinese culture and society. I think that's very important that w there was cultural adaptation. It wasn't just picking out words that were important in U.S. culture. There was very specific adaptation to Chinese culture and society and Rong used several inf informants um, to confirm that uh, the words that she, the new <coughs> words that were related to uh, to Chinese culture and society were um, what we thought they were doing. Uh, 16 words were tested. I'm going to show graphs for six. This time, we made a methodological advance. We were able to explore statistical correlations between socio-demographic trends and word frequency trends. Before, I just had two, I had graphs, but there was no actual correlation statistic. But they, um, Google improved the tool from when I first started using it to when we did the second study. And you can now, by moving your cursor, you can now get every individual year as a, a data point, an exact data point, which enabled us to do these correlations fairly easily. Um, we also took into account specific characteristics of the Chinese language. Uh, one characteristic is they don't, um, that the language doesn't distinguish between nouns and verbs, so that distinction that I had used in doing my selection was not meaningful. Um, probably the most important um, modification to adapt to the language was that we took, um, that we used two character words because they have more specific, more specific meanings than one character words. And remember that specificity is important in word selection. Okay, so here, um, as predicted, the frequency of um, uh, the word private goes up when economic reform starts. Remember, um, we're really looking at two different periods and we're taking that into account. Um, note that the word communal goes up during the Cultural Revolution, which is a highly collectivistic period, and then goes down uh, during the period of economic reform. 
um, to the right of the red, uh, the vertical red dotted line. So notice that this is not just an exact replication, it's also a, a, um, an adaptation to uh, what's going on in China politically um, over time, as well as what's going on economically. So here, um, this slide shows the correlations between the ecological factors and the frequencies of private and communal. Um, and so, of course, we, uh, they're exactly as predicted. Um, urban population is uh, significantly correlated with the frequency of the word private, as is household expenditure per capita wealth as is tertiary school enrollment. And also it's predicted um, those ecological indicators of Gesellschaft environment are negatively correlated with the frequency of the word communal, which is an adaptation to a Gemeinschaft world. Um, and you see minus 0.65 communal with urban population, minus 0.668 with uh, wealth, an indicator and minus 0.767 with uh, post-secondary school enrollment. These are the um, graphs for autonomy and um, uh, obedience or compliance. And you can see that uh, after um, economic reform started here, it just autonomy just became much more important. And um, obedience and compliance just went down a little bit. That's the, uh, the blue line. And of course, autonomy is at the heart of individualism, independence of thought, and so independence of action, that's autonomy. And it's very important in a market economy. The market economy also prioritizes um, choice. And you see the word, uh, the, the characters for choose go up. And, but this is interesting, and this, this responds to the question of, well, are there complexities or reactions when you undergo such rapid social change? And you can see that the word obliged, um, that frequency also goes up. But and one interesting, which we see as a reaction to rising individualism, and there definitely has been a reaction in China on the part of the government, on the part, to some extent, of the older generation. My next, my next study will um, speak to that a little more. But one thing that's interesting is that the frequency of choose is going up more rapidly and more sharply than the frequency of obliged. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is to compare Chinese and U.S. culture at a contemporary time point. And the time point is um, 2008. And what you can see is although, um, although um, so, um, these values have been kind of moving in the same direction as U.S. values, that the frequency of obliged is many times greater in China than it is in, in the U.S. corpus, in the Chinese books versus the U.S. corpus. Um, you can also see that the, um, the frequency of choose is very, they're, they're not very different. So the individualistic words are um, kind of uh, similar in frequency to the US, between the US and China, but the collectivistic word <coughs> still has a big difference. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting here is that you can see in both countries, choose is much more frequent than obligation. Choice is more, for, it seems to be a more important value in 2008 in both countries compared with obligation as a con concept. Yeah? Can you, can you say a little bit about uh, how frequent the Chinese characters are for, for obliged? Because I, I don't have a good feel for the synonyms for the US if there are many synonyms for obliged and if you, if you 
Um, okay, well, um, one thing wrong, believe me, I do not speak Chinese, so Rong was in charge of this, but one thing that it doesn't exactly answer your question, but it's the kind of thing that will answer your question. She, fa she found that um, Chu's is so broad in Chinese that she added together all the English synonyms of Chu's, select, like Chu's select up. So she dealt with what she thought were differences between the concepts, the way the concepts mapped onto the language or the way the language mapped onto the concepts. So I think if she had felt that um, that needed to be done with obliged, she would have done it. But um, you know, clearly obligation has become much less important in the United States, and that's what we saw in the historical um, comparison within the United States where we're using the same word in the same language in the same country. Was there somebody over here who wanted? Okay. Okay, so let me, um, oh my gosh, I think I skipped. I think it's sort of, no, it's okay. Um, let me um, summarize and conclude from this study. Um, you'll see the lists of words are bigger because there are words I didn't show you. But as predicted by the theory, the words indexing individualistic values, which were choose, compete, get, private, autonomy, talent, innovation, and fairness, all became more important in Chinese culture during the, mar the period of a development of a market economy. Um, the correlations also worked for all of these words. They confirmed that rising individualism is significantly related to growing urbanism, increasing wealth, and higher levels of formal education. Some values adapted to Gemeinschaft social environment, specifically the, word, the values indexed by the words communal, obedience, effort, help, and sacrifice, declined as predicted. But we think in reaction to social change, other collectivistic words, for example, obligation and give, increased in frequency, but in each case more slowly than the individualistic words. However, despite changes in China over time, the direct comparison shows that China is still more collectivistic than the United States, but catching up on individualism. Okay, so that's the big data. No, that's one more thing. Before going from big data to little data, um, I want to discuss the methodological strengths and weaknesses of the NGRAM viewer as a research tool for investigating culture change. So the strengths are it's good for exploring long-term culture change. For English, um, the, a strength is that the scanned books come from many libraries in the United States, um, also from the Oxford University Library in the UK. Weaknesses less suited to exploring short-term culture change. I think the newspapers would, um, corpus would do better at that. And for the Chinese study, and this really shocked us, we got this information from the head of research at Google. Uh, no books were scanned in Chinese libraries. Um, they were all from libraries in the United States. They, Google works with more than 40 libraries mainly in Europe and the United States, mostly in the United States, but a lot in Europe also, but there were none in Chinese libraries. So we did a little control. Rong um, looked at um, the topics in the UCLA um, card catalog because the UCLA library is one of the libraries that let Google scan all their books and, and therefore we're part of that database, the book database. And then she compared them with the card catalog in, um, at her home university at that time, Beijing Normal University, and um, she found a similarity in topic distribution. Uh, there were a couple of differences, um, but they went in the direction of, um, they would have, 
if they, if they um, introduced a bias, our results would have been stronger without that bias. So they basically, if there was a bias, it weakened our results, but our results were very strong, so they just would have been stronger. Okay. Um, now to the individual level, uh, it's a study of um, three generations in China with uh, three collaborators from China, Zhu, Yu, and Wu. Um, other one, there's one more, Lin. So this is, the, um, this is the study. It's a study of child socialization and preschool um, child behavior across three uh, generations in China. Um, uh, Chan Zhu interviewed 19 uh, grandmothers in 2014. All of them were their um, grandchildren's caregivers. And the grandmothers were asked to compare First, parent socialization strategies, the way they were raised compared with the way they raised their children compared with the way their grandchildren were being raised. So it's their perception. Um, and, uh, but the grandmothers were used as a measuring instrument to compare the generations and the grandmothers were familiar with all three generations. Then um, also the preschool child behavior, the grandmothers were asked to compare their own behavior as a child between the ages of four and six, their children's behavior at the same age between four and six, and their grandchildren's behavior. And the grandchildren were all currently between ages four and six. So, um, starting with the learning environment. And we did some um, non-parametric statistics where we looked at frequency of patterns. Um, they saw um, their, they, the grandmothers saw their parents as more critical, as the most critical of all the generations. They saw uh, themselves as in the middle and then they saw their children as the least critical of their children. They also, they also found um, that they had, that their parents had given the least support, for example, for child autonomy. Uh, they were in the middle and that their, um, uh, their children were giving the, uh, the most support as parents for the child autonomy of the current generation of four to six year olds and similar for praise. They found that the current four to six year olds were getting the most praise from their parents. They had gotten the least praise. The grandmothers had gotten the least praise as children from their parents. Okay, what about uh, child behavior? These are the predictions that children are going from more to less obedient across the generations from less autonomous to more autonomous. And note, autonomy was one of the things, uh, concepts on the cultural level as well. From less curious um, in the oldest generation themselves to the most curious in their grandchildren, from less extra, least extroverted, extroverted themselves to more uh, most extroverted in the children's, uh, the current children's generation. These were the predictions, and now I'm going to show you um, the results. And you can see that all of these predictions are confirmed. Um, these are child behaviors. So this would be the grandmothers <coughs> as children, the mothers as children, and the grandchildren as children. And you can see that for curiosity, autonomy, extroversion, and expressiveness, um, they, they see the current generation as being, having the most of those qualities which are adaptive in the market economy environment, and obedience they see as going down with each generation. That's this. And, uh, you can see the, the statistically significant differences in the patterns. OK. 
Okay, now what I want to do is um, show you some narratives of the grandmother, some, some case studies that the first um, case study will uh, show how the, the grandmothers um, uh, conceptualize the comparison of obedience and autonomy across the generations. So this case study illustrates the growth of child autonomy and the decline of obedience. So this grandma, oh, first let me start with the socio-demographics because they ref the, the socio-demographics of this individual family across the generation mirrors China as a whole and what you saw when I um, gave you the survey results. So the grandmother was born in 1944. She had six um, siblings. Her parents went to middle school. Um, her child was born in 1968, had one sibling, so decline of family size. Uh, mother went to middle school, father college. The third generation, born in 2006, was an only child, and both parents went to college. Uh, of course, it, it, that's reflecting the one child policy. <laughs> Um, but you can see that in terms of family size, decline of family size, and increase in parent education, the, this family is following China as a whole. Okay, what did the grandmother say? Um, she said about herself, I didn't have my own ideas. My generation, children always listen to adults. We did whatever adults told us to do. We wouldn't talk back. So we didn't have any ideas on our own. Then she says of her daughter, my daughter was so autonomous, too rebellious. This little girl had a lot of her own ideas. And then she says of her grandchild, my grandchild is autonomous. She has to get whatever she wants. Sometimes my daughter and my grandchild live at my place. When I told them to move back to their own apartment, my grandchild said she wanted to live here and she wouldn't leave even if someone threw her out. She's not just autonomous, but she's also uh, lacking respect for authority or obedience. Okay, so this, um, this um, case study across the generations shows an intergenerational increase in the support for autonomy on the part of the family. And it's a different family from the case study I just um, uh, showed you. So looking at the socio-demographics, again, you can see they reflect China as a whole um, in terms of sibling sets from um, three siblings to an only child, an only child in, in both of the later generations. From both parents having no education in the first generation, mother having an associate degree and father college in the second generation an increase, and then a further increase in the third generation where both parents have been to college. So what did this grandmother say? So she was asked, did your parents support your ideas? No, my parents didn't pay much attention. Then she says um, about the, the same question about her daughter, um, I bought an accordion for my daughter. I asked her if she liked it, she said she did. But later I realized she didn't really enjoy playing it, so I didn't force her. I noticed my daughter liked drawing when she was little, so I encouraged her and supported her. And then she says, then she talks about her grandchild. Um, and you'll see though, there's obviously an increase in support. Um, it gets even more extreme in the, this, uh, with her grandchild. She said, Tatao, um, her grandchild, liked playing Go, but none of us knew how to play. So his mother made a phone call and let him play Go with a child who lives in the neighborhood. His parents would buy anything he likes and let him learn anything he wants. So complete autonomy and also child-centeredness. And you'll remember um, that uh, increase in child-centeredness was one thing I talked about with, in the first study in the United States. So let me summarize um, the, the, uh, this cross-generational Chinese preschool study. Um, we see changing socialization strategies, a new learning environment. And these strategies and children's response to them are 
behavioral manifestations, I would say, of implicit value change. And both the altered learning environments and the altered child behavior um, are adaptive in the conditions of a growing market economy. And I think most interesting, and I think this is the pertinent aspect of this last study for um, the method our methodological discussion, we see a harmony between the cultural level and the individual level, the cultural level being measured by the Google Ngram viewer and the individual level being measured by interviews. Um, so we saw growth in the frequency of the Chinese term for autonomy in the Google database on the cultural level and also growth uh, increase in the grandmother's judgment that each generation is getting more autonomous than the one before on the individual level. So, in conclusion, um, culture isn't static and therefore cultural psychologies are not static. Sociodemographic transformations lead to change cultural values and learning environments which then lead to change uh, child behaviors. In a, in a case of rapid social change, such as we have in China, probably the most rapid in the world, we see cultural complexity in two opposing trends, increasing individualism and reactive collectivism. So with increasing urbanization, formal education, and wealth, we find greater individualism on both the cultural and individual level, and we have evidence from around the world, in the US, the UK, and China, and it was mentioned Germany is the same. I just got a, a, a paper to review doing the same, using the same Google methodology in Russia, same results. Um, I want, to, I want to say actually something else. The Google Ngram viewer t shows us something about culture change in the past. But the three generation study shows us what's going to happen in the future. These children who are the most individualistic are only between four and six years of age. And so this generational change, I think, uh, indicates that China will keep going in this direction culturally for the next 30 years when these children will start to, the present generation of young children will start to be in charge of the society. The people in charge of the society now were um, socialized when, uh, with a completely different set of values before the market economy. So some methodological conclusions. Um, the Google Ngram viewer is the first tool that has allowed the quantitative analysis of culture change over centuries. And the emphasis on the first tool to allow the quantitative analysis. We can measure culture with a big data method and then find it reflected on the level of individuals using a small data method, the interview study. But as I um, mentioned a moment ago, each method also shows us something unique. The Ngram viewer change in the past, the intergenerational study, what's going to happen in the future. And I just want to end with my thank yous for funding from the China Scholarship Council for Rong and the UCLA Office of Cross-Campus and Interdisciplinary Affairs, and that is all. because that is so important. Right now, there's, there's a huge, I can only call it a stink, about lack of replication. And nobody's thinking about the fact that replication, the lack of replication 20 years later, 
um, may not reflect unreliable data, but may reflect culture change. It's actually has recently been suggested to me to write a psych science article about that because um, if you actually look at the lists of studies, you can kind of imagine using my theory why the results would have changed. Not because they were wrong before, but because the society has changed. So I'm really glad you brought up that point. Yes? Um, I had a question about the Google school. Um, I was wondering about whether there, are, whether you think that there are differences between what gets published in books and what the general population of culture is. Especially I thought about this when I saw the graph about the Chinese revolution. Um, you can think about, so who's funding books that write showing what the values are, yeah. even though not everybody may read the book. Yeah. But Patricia, I mean, her, her question gets becomes particularly important because Google scanned university libraries. So a lot of the stuff, like popular novels, I, I mean, all the stuff that would top the sales figures in a bookstore is probably not in the corpus. That might be true. Um, right? I, I, I mean, there's, there's something funny in, in the Google database. Because Can I just say something yeah. about the corpus though that would yeah. sort of go against that? Yeah. Um, I know in the UCLA library there's a huge collection of children's books. Oh, okay. So, okay. you know, the, yeah, yeah. It, it's, sort of on, it's sort of on both sides. Oh. Um, but I think that would be interesting, but we don't have any way of, of dealing, it, dealing with it. What do you, do you, do you think that, um, I, I, I would say if we looked at popular books in the United States that might not be in our um, university libraries, we would still find a reflection of our values. For example, how-to books have been getting more and more individualistic. It's actually more extreme than anything you would find in a university library. That might be true in China, too. How to um, raise your child, which might not be in the library. It's probably, uh, I'm sure, judging from the three generations are getting more and more individualistic. So it's too bad we don't have, uh, at least yet, but maybe you have this in Germany, um, you could compare the Google database with, um, say, a newspaper database that you probably have in Ch and just see, yeah, you know, investigate this question uh, empirically. I would guess the trends would be the same, but the levels could be different. Now, let's see. Um, I have to go back in the slides to. the topics, I think. Okay, okay, so um, she used the card catalog topics. Um, three of the five most frequent book categories were the same in both countries, literature, history and politics, no, literature, history and politics, those three were the, were the same, um, uh, were among the three uh, most um, 
we're, we're in the five most frequent book ca categories. Philosophy and life and health, life slash health, were in the top five categories at UCLA, but not at Beijing Normal University. Economics and industrial technology were in the top five categories in Beijing, but not UCLA. So those are those are uh, the categories that were used. Type of category. Curation between the two libraries. Well, it was fairly similar. Yeah. yeah, fairly similar. We were kind of surprised at how similar it was. Yeah. You know, you think, oh, I mean, we just about died when we heard from Queer Norvig at, from, at Google that uh, they didn't have any books in China. <laughs> you know, they hadn't scanned anything in China. But then when we looked at this, we were pleasantly surprised at how similar they were. Yes. you can do is you can limit um, the, you know, the time. <clears throat> so you could just search for books 1892. So that way you could look at uh, you know, what was published at a, at a specific time. So that would give you more fine grained data. It would give you some it would give you some information, but you know, libraries don't necessarily have all the books. And, right. You know, some libraries would have some of the books, others would have others. So, um, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm quite amazed that, you know, I, I mean, you're getting the clear trends and this I mean, makes, a lot, makes a lot of sense. At the same time, I can't quite get over this sampling issue. I mean, as an analogy, it seems to me, by the time you're using a corpus, that it's based on what a few elite uni university libraries bought. That, that looks a bit as if we're analyzing TV programming by, by analyzing NPR, mm -hmm. okay? which, which is clearly something that would reflect cultural trends, but at the same time would have some disconnect to what is actually consumed by the majority in that culture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm not sure what to do with Who's that. Who's reading books anyway? Who's, I mean, who's very, uh, <laughs> yes, and, and when you're reading books, I mean, when you're looking at, at sales figures, right? I mean, you have to look, I mean, the New York Times now has a separate thing called mass market fiction, which has basically no overlap to what we usually think of as a top sellers, except that it sells more by a factor of four, five, six. So, I, I, I mean, there is uh, some well, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that, that the, this is a really interesting question. Um, I would say that if you think there is such a thing as a national culture, that you would tend to get the same trends yeah. and not the yeah. same levels. But I'm waiting for you to do yeah. the study yeah. to compare um, a more popular yeah. type of database like newspapers with the Google database and see what you know whether you do um, you do replicate the trends. And I think that only that will really answer the question. social networking, and that kind of thing. And um, you know, so I was thinking we could develop our research by using some of the tools. And it would be really great to, to learn how, how we could mine the blogosphere, for example. Yes, yes. Well, just to, to add, and also what you said earlier, right? Um, I mean, I love this stuff, right? And so, but there are certain dynamics 
like collectivism seems to be more associated with sort of uh, dictatorships, right? Governments that control much more what is being published, right? And then of course the corpora we're looking at with books, these are the authors, right? It's the authors of those books who write the books and they feel certain pressures and they have a sensitivity for what's going on in the culture, right? So we're looking at really their output. Uh, and so, like in our replication in Germany, we found that during World War II, during the Nazi times, where they had strong emphasis at, on certain values, right, we saw a reversal. So there is actually you know, something about also the government having an impact on the body of, of these written books. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's what we found kind of the same thing in the Chinese, um, no, in the American sample, the, that kind of a reversal around the same time. Uh, yeah, I think that the, you know, the politics is not, politics and sociodemographics are all related. But I would say, you know, sometimes people think, well, in a more authoritarian regime, a dictator regime, it's not going to reflect the people. But if you if you look at what our government says in our very free society, I mean, they're always talking about freedom, res individual responsibility. I would say they they are hammering home our philosophy and our values just as hard as the Chinese government was hammering home back in the day a different set of values. Sure. So. Yeah, also, if I may add, uh, with your small scale study, I was wondering, you know, whether there is this interplay between uh, different factors. Like you were showing that the, the earliest generation, um, they had many more siblings, right? So if you have six children, of course, obedience it's going to be, has to be stronger, right? You cannot be child-centered so much because there are six of them, right? And so, so there is this going back and forth and China implemented the one-child policy and now I think they reverted to two children. So they might actually, going through that, work towards more collectivism. Okay, I'm going to comment on both those okay. things. What you said is exactly what I was trying to show, that all of these socio-demographics are pushing things in the same direction. And definitely, sibling set is a huge proximal cause of, of you know, being more child-centered or less child-centered, more giving or less giving. And th that's exactly what we're tr you know, trying to uh, show. OK, now, the two-child policy. We've been discussing this. And uh, I think what I, my Chinese students think, and what I think, and what um, demographic trends around the world show is that, well, in fact, this, um, I have a current Chinese student, and this came up with her <coughs> in the presentation of some related research just the other day. And she said, well, but you know, in the city, people are saying they don't want two children. They don't want them because they're expensive. And therefore, they don't need the, as my theory, they don't really need the one child policy anymore because um, people are going to want smaller families as money becomes more important, as children stop um, working in the field because they're in rural environments and parents have to give them an education, which is expensive. Uh, this will change. Um, on its own, and we have evidence in other, I've, I've, I've several other countries I've been working in, and the same kinds of demographic transitions have been happening as the socio-demographics change without any policy about them. Okay, well, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.